today we are going to recap a little bit what we have seen uh, last uh, week. Uh, let me share the screen. Okay, so the I understand that now you would like to have uh, some examples uh, in order to better understand what we are we have discussed so far, because of course uh, now you have uh, uh, a lot of formulation, but uh, you are still missing uh, numerical examples. Uh, but before going to uh, a realistic example or basically numerical exercise that we are going to do next week. Uh, I would like to give you additional explanation regarding the uh, quaternion expression because I got I got a few questions last week uh, that basically let, let me understand that you need uh, an introduction, uh, an in-depth introduction to quaternion because I thought that part of the representation was already discussed in, in other courses. But I'm realizing that probably uh, you need to have uh, a short uh, reintroduction to those uh, formulation. So what we have seen so far, we have introduced the uh, dynamical, uh, so the kinematic equation of the uh, of the um, of the attitude of a spacecraft by using the quaternion representation. Uh, and uh, I got a few questions regarding this product of quaternions. Um, so it is probably better to, to show you uh, what we uh, need, uh, um, so what those formulation really uh, means, because I mean, uh, I understand that uh, if you use a different uh, uh, book as reference, you can have a different formulation. So I would like to be sure that you're able to understand what we're meaning in these slides. So that's the reason why I would like to add a brief formulation of the quaternions. It is also helpful for what we're going to do today. So first of all, I assume that you know that when you do uh, the product, um, the cross product of a vector, so for example, you have omega, you, uh, you are able to represent this uh, product as uh, this Q symmetric matrix uh, with uh, a zero diagonal, a zero diagonal elements uh, and uh, the off diagonal elements that are given by the following expression. Okay, so this is uh, something that I'm pretty sure that you know, but it's also related to the quaternion expression. So what we have seen uh, before. So this is a skew symmetric matrix. So you have omega z, anti-symmetric matrix. So you have omega minus omega y, and uh, this is omega x. So let me actually use, uh, um, the um, text box and uh, the that would be useful. So um, actually, for 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 now, not because of what I would like to introduce uh, is uh, the representation that we have seen so far. So we have seen that we when when we want to do the product of two quaternions, so the multiplication of two quaternions, so we have introduced this symbol, okay? So you have Q hat uh, times Q. And we have seen uh, that we are able to represent this multiplication of quaternion by using the Kale table, this one here, okay? We have uh, verified that that is correct, although there are a few signs here that are wrong, I realized yesterday. Uh, but the main uh, uh, representation that you can find in literature is the one that we have seen when we introduce uh, the attitude matrix. So the, uh, sorry, the attitude kinematics uh, 
uh, equations. So these metrics, uh, uh, Q, so this product here can be indeed uh, represented similar to a skew anti-symmetric matrix of uh, the cross product of a vector. So these uh, matrix here, that is these uh, Q at uh, with this symbol here, it is a four by four matrix where the last column is given by these, uh, uh, the, um, so the vector part of the Q vector. So Q at will be uh, the the uh, vector part of the quaternion plus Q4, okay? So this is a three by one uh, vector and this is a Q4. And uh, this one is a minus a Q transpose uh, hat. That is uh, the, uh, in this case will be a one by three vector. This three by three matrix is given by the real part of the quaternion uh, Q4 Q4 at uh, times the identi identity matrix uh, three by three, three by three, minus the uh, this uh, expression of uh, the cross product of a vector. So this is only the vector part of the quaternion. So maybe your confusion comes from the fact, so I, I suppose that you already knew this, uh, um, this expression, uh, but this is uh, what it is uh, behind this formulation of, uh, uh, so this uh, uh, direct uh, representation of the matrix omega. Okay, so you can uh, verify that indeed, if you uh, use this expression to determine omega, of omega where this uh, omega is a quaternion with uh, a vector part plus uh, a real part that is equal to zero, okay? So you have the diagonal matrix is equal to zero as you can see here and each uh, diagonal, uh, so the each of diagonal elements are given by the expression that you can find here. You have to be, uh, you have to consider that uh, the representation of the quaternion for the attitude. So this is omega that is given by this matrix here. So when you do omega times uh, omega of times Q. This Q vector here, this Q quaternion is a vector with the first three elements equal to the uh, vector part of the quaternion. And the fourth one is the scalar. You can check that if you multiply these uh, matrix to this vector, you can have exactly the same result, results when you do the Kali table that you have here. The only difference that you have to be careful that here, the, um, um, the quaternion is defined with the scalar part as a first element. That's a, the, probably, probably your, your, uh, your confusion because in this case, uh, F is the scalar part, so it is our Q4. So in general, uh, for attitude uh, determination, uh, the quaternion is expressed with the vector, so with uh, 
a quaternion with the first three elements equal to the uh, the vector part, and the fourth one is the scalar part. If you do this product, indeed, you get what you have from the Callis table. So I think that clarified your uh, doubt. Uh, you, can, you can check that when you do these two products, indeed, you're able to get exactly the same results. So the reason why I'm going faster to this part is because those uh, um, representation should be already discussed in previous courses. So here we are only recalling these important uh, um, background because we need to use it for our um, attitude determination software. So last week, there are any questions regarding this uh, product? Okay, if you have uh, questions, ask me during the break. But in the meantime, uh, we can uh, uh, go further. And um, now that we have uh, discussed uh, that basically, so usually this part of the quaternion is also called the uh, big Q, so the vector part of the quaternion, and this is the real part Q4. So what we have discussed last week was to um, the two main um, methods that were are, that are used in attitude determination for the uh, for the static attitude determination of the spacecraft. So what is also called the single frame uh, attitude determination. So we are trying to determine the uh, attitude of a spacecraft at a specific time. What uh, the, uh, these methods are not able to do is to, for, for example, propagate the state of your attitude. So for example, if you, know, if you want to know the uh, attitude of the spacecraft at a different time, so after a specific epoch, you, you are only able to use the measurements that you have at that time, but you are not uh, including the information that you collect, for example, the uh, previous time step. Uh, this is enabled by the Kalman filter that we're going to see next week. So you have to keep in mind that these methods that we're going to see today, and we have already introduced last week, are only able to process measurement at one specific time or uh, measurements that are very close in time. The first method that we have introduced and we already solved is the triad algorithm. Uh, I mean, there is no need to do any uh, exam, numerical example for this one because it is really straightforward. Uh, we knew that uh, uh, if we have uh, uh, the, uh, for example, two sensors that are able to give us the position, so the relative orientation of a specific body with respect to the body frame of the spacecraft, for example, let's say uh, the Earth and the Sun, we are able to construct a triad and that's the reason, uh, the reason why it is also called the triad algorithm, to determine the uh, attitude matrix of the spacecraft. As we have discussed last week, uh, uh, the minimum number of parameters that we need to, uh, to know to determine the attitude of the spacecraft is three. Uh, but this method uses uh, two versors, and so it is based on the assumption that we know four components. Um, the main uh, advantage of this method that is really simple because we took one of the observation. So W are the measurement of the relative uh, orientation of a specific body uh, with respect to the OBF, uh, so the optical bench frame. The uh, same body is also, so the relative position of the same body is also known in the ICRF, so in the inertial celestial ref reference frame. So we know the position in the body frame from the sensor, and we know the position of, uh, so the orientation of that body in the inertial reference frame 
if we have stars from the catalog, if we are considering the Earth and the Sun from the ephemeris of the planets. So since we know these vectors, we are able to construct a triad. And so we take one of the observation, multiply, and so we do a cross product between the two observation. And the third one give us the opportunity to have an orthogonal direction. So an orthonormal triad that is important because we need a three by three matrix in order to invert this problem here. So the vector X are the triad constructed in the orbit uh, optical bench frame. The, uh, we do the same with the vector or actually the versor of the um, of that object in the inertia reference frame by inverting this expression and since we construct the orthonormal um, reference frame, we are able to uh, determine directly the attitude. So this is uh, uh, a direct inversion that only that is only based from the transpose of this matrix. So the main disadvantage of this method, as we already discussed last week, is that we are only able to process two observation at a time. And the problem is that we are not weighting the two observation at the same way. The reason why we're not weighting the observation the same way is because we are doing the cross product between W1 and W2 that basically cancel out the contribution of W2 in the direction of W1. So for example, if we have that the Earth and the Sun are exactly 90 degrees, so for example, this is W1 and this is W2. In this case, the two observations are scaled exactly the same way. But in this case, in which we have an angle that is lower than 90 degrees, the component W2 parallel to W1 is not really used. And so we are downweighting this observation. That's the reason why. Uh, in the uh, 1965, uh, Grace of Waba proposed this uh, new method. So if we have multiple observations, and also if we have two observations, we need to um, weight each observation with respect to is, uh, uh, for example, precision, so the uh, instrument, instrument precision. So what we construct here, what we have constructed is a cons function J, that is a function of the attitude matrix, that is the sum of the quadratic expression of the, uh, uh, the versor in the optical bench, ref, uh, optical, optical bench frame and the uh, same vector in the ICRF. So our unknown, indeed, is the attitude matrix. So we know this one for, from the sensors. We know this one from the catalog or from the ephemeris. And we need to know A. So this represents the minimization of the cost function because our need is to, in, to uh, minimize the discrepancy from our observation and uh, the known orientation of those objects. So it's similar to what you have seen for the least square filter of the orbit determination. What we also have seen last week is that we, uh, this problem is uh, reduced to uh, a maximization of the cost function rather than a minimization of the cost function J. So what we have done is use a transformation of from the uh, um, vector form to, uh, so basically we manipulate the equations in order to find in the end that this expression J 
can be expressed as 1 minus ga, where this function ga has, uh, is given by the product of the active matrix to the vector, uh, to the bursar in the inertia uh, celestial reference frame. And the first, uh, um, and the transpose of the um, orientation of the celestial body uh, in the OBF. So this GA is what we want to maximize in order to minimize the cost function and minimize the errors between the observed observation and the um, known orientation of those objects. We also have discussed that, so I'm not going to go in detail on this one, that basically this GA is function of what is called the attitude profile matrix. So manipulating even further the uh, matricial form of uh, these sums, we are able to find that this GA is equal to the trace of a matrix that is the product of the attitude matrix and the transpose of the uh, attitude profile matrix. The attitude profile matrix is defined here, or here we, we define the transpose. So it is basically the, vec the, the product of the uh, vector in the ICRF and the vector in the OBF. So it's the uh, matrix given by the uh, multiplication of the components of these two vectors. So we have uh, what we need to do now. We need uh, to uh, maximize this cost function. So the maximization of uh, this cost function um, was uh, um, discussed in the 1970s in order to uh, determine the attitude of several spacecraft. So, for example, in the uh, 1978, uh, it was proposed a method that is called the Davenport's Q method to determine the uh, attitude of the high energy astronomy observatory. So, one spacecraft that uh, had the uh, goal to uh, observe the, uh, the sky from space. And so the telescope, this telescope needed a very accurate attitude. The Davenport's Q method is what we are going to see uh, in the next slide. So although in the slides you find uh, uh, that everything is treated as the quest algorithm, Actually, the, uh, the first part of the quest algorithm that consists in the um, um, determination of the um, quaternion that uh, indeed maximize this GA is based on the Davenport's uh, uh, Q method. The quest algorithm was a further approach that was, that was done in 1979 to determine the attitude of another spacecraft that is called Mansard. This spacecraft indeed um, needed uh, an attitude determination with uh, a frequency, so a larger frequency in the um, update of the attitude determination. Uh, so basically, the problem with the Davenport's method was uh, given by the fact that this uh, method was, didn't provide a solution uh, fast enough. So the quest algorithm was a further approach that was developed afterwards in order to provide a faster solution to the same problem. Our problem here is this, uh, the maximization of uh, GA. 
The reason why it is called the Quest algorithm and the Davenport's method is called the Davenport's Q method is because this Davenport's Q method uh, is based on quaternion and the Quest algorithm means a quaternion estimator. So in order to, um, so our goal here, as I told you last week, I'm going to explain uh, uh, each pass of those formulation, but our final goal, I will already tell you, is that we will demonstrate that the maximization of these, uh, um, of these uh, uh, cost function correspond to an eigenvalue problem. So what we are going to find is that in the end, we will find the um, representation of eigenvalue, eigenvector problem. And we need to find the quaternion that solve this eigenvalue, eigenvector problem. So all those uh, further passages, uh, since you have this upper triangle on, uh, on the slide, we don't, when we will have the exam, we are not going to ask you every single pass of this demonstration. But it is useful for you to better understand how those, um, how the final expression of uh, that problem is indeed retrieved. So it is a, a, for, um, a detailed demonstration that requires, uh, uh, that is required to understand why at the end, what we need to do is indeed only um, determine uh, this uh, um, eigenvalue problem. So last week, uh, we briefly introduced uh, the uh, attitude matrix as a function of the quaternion. So that's the reason why last week I um, introduced you that these attitude matrix can be expressed with, a, with this form with respect to the quaternion. So here the quaternion, as I told you, is given by a vector part Q, bold Q, and Q4, that is a scalar part of the quaternion. Q tilde is the uh, skew antisymmetric matrix that corresponds to the cross product of the vector. What I told you before, it is basically our, this is Q. I do the arrow because I'm not able to do the uh, bold, but, but this one corresponds to this uh, uh, cross product. Okay, so we are able to determine the attitude matrix as a function of the quaternion because we have them we have briefly introduced last week so what we need to do here is to explicit the um, dependency of the attitude matrix to the quaternion so first of all what we do is uh, to um, determine the uh, attitude profile matrix uh, that was given by this expression. And we know that the attitude matrix is given by uh, the, uh, this function of the quaternions. So here it is really simple because we are trying to compute the trace of the matrix it is the multiplication of A times the attitude profile matrix transpose. The first two elements are really, um, are really uh, trivial because basically if you do A times B transpose, you can see that basically the first term is identity matrix times B transpose. And uh, uh, if you do the trace of this first part, it is indeed you can uh, take this part out from the trace and that will be only the uh, transpose of the attitude profile matrix. The reason why you're able to, um, 
take it out is because uh, these are only scalars, okay? This is uh, the scalar part of the quaternion, but this is also a, a scalar because it is a Q transpose Q. So it is a one by three vector times a three by one vector. So it is also a scalar. This one is a little bit uh, more complicated, so we're going to do here. And the main problem will be the third term. So when, you, when we do indeed these matrix times the attitude profile matrix transpose. So first of all, uh, we uh, further modify this expression because uh, what we can do here, for example, is um, to uh, multiply uh, the trace uh, on the left and on the right with the same exactly component. So what we do here, for example, is that we can write Q4 trace B transpose Q4, and we can also put the trace between the two vectors Q transpose and Q. That will be useful later when we want to explicit that uh, formulation. The other component, so these two uh, um, trays of Q, Q transpose, B transpose. So here Q, Q transpose is a matrix because it's a three by one by one by three vector. So what we do here is that since we have two trays, we can uh, pro we can adopt uh, some matricial computational uh, forms. So what we can do here is uh, to write the same trace as the transpose of uh, this expression here. So two times the trace of this uh, matrix is equal to the trace of this matrix plus this matrix transpose. You can easily, if you, if you don't know this property, you can easily compute by yourself. Uh, but um, that enables us to also explicit the same, uh, the same, uh, uh, in the same way this term. So what you can find here is that uh, these uh, trace of Q, Q transpose, B transpose is equivalent to Q transpose, B transpose, Q. So, as I told you, this is a one by three vector. So if you compute uh, these, uh, this is also a scalar because basically it is the multiplication of Q transpose, one by three vector, three by three and three by one. So at the end you have a one by, 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 one, by one element that is uh, equivalent to the trace of this matrix. Uh, same story for uh, uh, for this one. We can indeed do the transpose of this term, so it will be B transpose Q Q transpose. And by manipulating even further, at the end, what we want to do, I know that seems to be uh, redundant and repetitive, uh, but it's only um, so. That's the reason why we don't we don't want. Uh, ask you that uh, during the exam. But the important thing is that uh, you are able to explicit uh, these terms uh, in this uh, final formulation here. So basically you have that uh, this Q transpose B transpose Q comes from here. And we can use the same property of a trace of a matrix for this uh, product here. So it will be indeed now here, Q transpose of B, Q. So at the end, uh, this term here is expressed by this formulation here. So it is uh, Q transpose times B plus B transpose Q. And it's also a scalar because as you know, this is a one by three and three by three and three by one. So now the main problem, if uh, you found uh, complicated this one, uh, that one, uh, it is uh, even worse. And you have a dedicated slide on that. So I'm not going to discuss in detail every single uh, passages, but what you can understand here is that uh, what we are doing 
is uh, to trying to express uh, this multiplication of quaternion and matrix in this form. So have the quaternions that multiply, so the quaternion components that multiply the, um, the matrix on the left side and the right side. So to have a compact form of the uh, cost function GA, that is our goal to maximize. So as I told you, these uh, element here, two Q4 trace of Q transpose, B transpose, uh, requires uh, further, further modification. So the first modification that we need to do is to explicit the attitude profile matrix by using the definition of the vector W and the vector V. So what we do here, as we have done before, two times, uh, so two, uh, two Q4 times trace can be uh, explicitly um, modified by using, so um, these two will be the first part given by exactly by the product of Q tilde B transpose plus the transpose of that matrix here. Okay, so it's the same thing that we have did here. It's the same uh, um, property of the trace of a matrix. So this is a, a straightforward. The, uh, so the second step here, the only thing that I, uh, we did is uh, to um, do the transpose of this matrix. So basically, when you do the transpose, uh, you know that the, the transpose of, um, of Q tilde is equal to minus Q tilde. The reason why it is, uh, as I said, is uh, if you see the expression of Q tilde and you, uh, you do indeed the minus Q tilde, this uh, uh, is exactly the transpose of Q tilde. Okay, so this is equal to minus the transpose of Q tilde. It's easy to be demonstrated. That's the reason why there is a minus here. And since we have did the transpose, here you have W, V transpose. So you commuted these two uh, vectors. The other properties that we have to do, and uh, that should be recalled by uh, previous uh, uh, courses uh, is that uh, the um, when you do the cross product of two vectors uh, and the uh, and the top product uh, this is equal to minus the uh, q uh, so the the dot product of this vector uh, to the cross product of the other two so basically this is uh, the property of a cross and dot product so we commutate these uh, to uh, these three vectors so you can indeed um, modify this expression to this one. The reason why you can do that is because this Q tilde VI, as I told you, corresponds to Q vector of V. So this is the cross product of Q times V, okay? and the dot product of w, wi. So if you apply this uh, property, you obtain exactly this. This is uh, the dot product expressed in uh, matricial form and the uh, cross product is indeed the w tilde that I can write here. So w tilde will be exactly the same to q tilde. So it will be a skew anti-symmetric matrix. Oh, 
with uh, of diagonal components equal to this one. So here you will have minus omega three, uh, W three, um, W one, W two, and W one. W2 and W1. And you have the antisymmetric, so it will be W3 minus W2. Okay. I know that it is really redundant, but it is useful only to explicit the form. So once you have done that, a similar approach can be done for the second element. Okay, so you can indeed use the properties of the dot and cross product of the vectors. And what you get at the end, not really at the end, but just before, is this expression of the, uh, of basically the quaternion vector times the vector of the observable in the inertial reference frame and the vector versor of the, that is measured by the, the sensors. Similarly, what we have done before, our main goal is to explicit this form in multiplication of two parts of the quaternions on the left and the right side. So we can explicit this term easily by writing this Q transpose times the sum of each measurement i times a i, di and w i times Q4. And this one will be exactly the transpose. So it will be Q4 uh, times the sum of i AI. And so we basically, the third term that we have uh, here, this one, this minus uh, two, so uh, it's not, is, uh, this is the plus because it's not the minus of a Q4 trace of uh, the product of the attitude matrix times the uh, attitude profile matrix is indeed this one, okay? So this is uh, really, I know, boring and uh, redundant uh, uh, demonstration, but our main goal was indeed to explicit this product of matrix, so A in fun as function of Q, times uh, the attitude profile matrix uh, in a form uh, that uh, we have always uh, Q4 uh, times uh, a scalar, in this case it's the trace of the matrix, uh, or for example, um, Q transpose uh, times a matrix uh, times Q. So all of them are scalars, uh, but depends on the quaternion and the attitude profile matrix that is given by these elements here, as you can see here. Okay, so at the end, indeed, we have, we were able to determine this first element here, the second element here, and the third element here by using the properties of matrix and vectors. Our final goal, indeed, is to explicit this cost function GA as the product of uh, the quaternions times a matrix. The reason why we indeed use this expression here was uh, uh, in order to have a final matrix K. So, if you uh, regroup every single element of this sum that give you the cost function GA, you can find that every single element corresponds to um, the, a part of the matrix K that is given by this expression here. So what we were able to do was to uh, do the transpose of the quaternion times this matrix K times the quaternion. 
And this is a fundamental uh, problem because we, um, it corresponds to indeed to the main assumption of the Davenport's Q method. In order to solve these metrics, so in order to maximize these cost function GA, what we need to do is uh, to find the quaternion that maximize this function. In order to, to maximize this function, so as you can see, the matrix K, each element of the matrix K is known because depends on the attitude profile matrix that depends on our observation, uh, sorry, on our observation and the non state of uh, the non attitude state of the, of the vector. And uh, uh, what you what you need to do um, is indeed uh, now to find a way to use this expression to determine the quaternion that uh, maximizes this cost function. So after the break, uh, what we are going to do is uh, to uh, try to determine a method that enables the um, uh, the knowledge of the quaternion since uh, the, the matrix K is given by the observation. So let's stop here. And uh, if you want to, uh, if you want to ask me questions through the break, uh, um, I will be able to answer. Resume uh, uh, recording and uh, sharing the screen. Yeah? So the conclusion of the first part of the lecture was indeed based on a very uh, onerous uh, uh, demonstration in which we had to perform a different matricial transformation in order to arrive to uh, these uh, uh, very straightforward uh, representation of the cost function GA. So GA is the cost function we want to maximize. And it is the product of the transpose of the quaternion, the matrix K and the Q. So the matrix K, we were able uh, with the transformation of the, uh, that we, we did uh, the, the previous hour, it is a function of the attitude profile matrix B and of course, uh, to the uh, weights of the, uh, so basically the scale coefficients of the measurements and the uh, observation uh, so that you have from your sensors and the uh, relative orientation of the observed bodies in the inertia reference frame. So all those elements are known because at each instant you have a number of observation i that could be equal to n for example and uh, you have you can construct your attitude profile matrix by doing this product here. So everything depends on uh, V, W, and the coefficients A. So this matrix, matrix every single time is well known. Now the problem is that we know the cost function, but we need to maximize the cost function. And in order to maximize this cost function, we are not able to change K. The only thing that we have to change is Q. And so what is related to the attitude matrix A. The maximization of uh, this function is uh, um, performed by using an additional condition. So we know that the quaternion are uh, with uh, a norm equal to one. So we know that Q transpose Q is equal to one. That is given by the fact that we define the quaternion as a function of the Euler angle and the Euler axis. So we know that Q transpose Q is equal to one. In order to maximize this function, so what we do is the derivative of the function with respect to the quaternion minus the uh, lambda uh, times Q transpose. So basically the additional constraint that we have on the quaternion is multiplied by the Lagrange multiplier. 
in order to have an expression that uh, indeed uh, maximizes this, uh, uh, this function. So if we do the derivative of this uh, uh, cost function minus the Lagrange multiplier times the uh, constraint function, we obtain, so that should be equal to zero in order to maximize this expression. We found out that this expression is equal to two times kq minus lambda q. So we have that uh, we have to solve for an eigenvalue problem. The eigenvalue is lambda. And we have to find a quaternion that solve this eigenvalue, eigenvalue uh, problem. So the maximization of the function GA at the end results in the uh, solution of an eigenvalue problem. And uh, so up to this uh, slide, uh, although we found uh, that uh, it is called the quest algorithm, it is uh, uh, based on the Davenport's Q method. So the Daven Davenport's Q method and the quest algorithm uh, are based on the solution of this eigenvalue problem. The only difference between the two is how these two methods solve this problem. The quest algorithm indeed will be uh, discussed later provides a, 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 a more efficient method to determine uh, this eigenvalue problem. So um, since we were able to demonstrate that to maximize uh, the um, cost function uh, Q transpose KQ, we have to solve for uh, an eigenvalue problem. This can also be written as lambda Q transpose Q. So we have to maximize lambda. So the largest eigenvalue corresponds to the maximization of the cost function. And so the quaternion corresponds to the eigenvector that it is given by the maximum lambda. It, is, uh, it has been demonstrated that, that the larger, the largest uh, eigenvalue is uh, equal, is very close to unity. So a fair method uh, to determine the quaternion is uh, to use uh, iteratively a Newton-Raphson method. So although the demonstration was really complicated, at the end, since uh, we know the expression of K, we can determine directly the uh, quaternion form as the eigenvector of uh, the the eigenvector of this uh, eigenvalue problem. So, for example, what you can do is that you start from lambda equal to one as an initial value. You determine the quaternion and iteratively use, using the Newton-Raphson method. You, you uh, stop your iteration uh, until convergence when the Q transpose, so when your quaternion indeed provides the best, uh, uh, yeah, the best approximation of uh, the cost function. As I told you, the real quest algorithm starts here because both methods, Davenport's and Quest, are based on the solution of the uh, of these uh, uh, of these um, eigenvalue problem. The approach that was proposed from the Quest algorithm is that we can use the uh, characteristic equation of the problem in order to determine directly the quaternion. So. Uh, in the quest algorithm, the uh, matrix K that is uh, given uh, in the uh, cost function GA is expressed uh, as a function of uh, three different uh, um, operators. So as uh, it is a B transpose uh, plus B, sigma is the trace of B, 
And uh, zeta is, uh, so z is a vector that is given by the sum of the cross product of w and uh, v. So the components of the four by one eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue, as we have said before, corresponds indeed to the spine. Yes. Um, are these hats uh, corresponding to versors uh, or do you mean these are versors or they are just vectors we've seen uh, pre previously uh, on the W and VY for the definition of Z? So the uh, also in the previews are, are, are versors. Uh, here basically the, the slides reports uh, the uh, nomenclature of, uh, of the method, uh, but in principle, the W and V are always versors. Okay, so yeah, I, I should also use uh, that one for the previous, but um, uh, in principle, the W and V are all... Sorry, uh, okay. And uh, so the reason why is because for these slides, uh, basically, is the scheme of the quest algorithm. So sometimes you can find the different uh, expression of the same uh, vector, but in principle, W and P are always versors. And the zeta is not a versor because, of course, it's a cross product of the two. And um, so you have that. Uh, um, S is a matrix that is given by B transpose times B. So the main problem here is that you need to um, you need to uh, solve the characteristic equation of the problem where alpha, beta, and gamma are functions of S, zeta, and sigma, so are also well known. So also in this case, the largest in value is equal to one. And um, the only difference is that uh, you use the neutral raphson method uh, for the uh, characteristic equation. There is a caveat for this method, of course. So the quest algorithm is a little bit less uh, more solid, is a little bit less uh, um, solid than the uh, Davenport skew method that I didn't present. So the Davenport skew method, instead of solving the uh, characteristic equation, is based on an iterative process on the matrix itself. So uh, basically it is uh, based on the characteristic equation that you have here. The uh, question algorithm uh, is based on the solution of the characteristic equation. So it is a little bit less accurate, but in terms of efficiency of the method, so in terms of the, uh, how fast the method is, you can gain uh, orders of magnitude of time. Uh, and that's the reason why historically the quest algorithm was uh, indeed uh, a successful method that is uh, still used today because it, it, it has a less accurate uh, determination but within the performances of the instrumentation. So by solving the characteristic equation, you are able to uh, obtain uh, a fair uh, reconstruction of the attitude every single instant. And that, that's the reason why the quaternion estimate or algorithm is a well spread, um, widespread uh, method used. Um, here, these slides, uh, I mean, it's not really, um, does not provide any details, uh, only give you uh, the fact that. Uh, of course, uh, when you solve the characteristic equations uh, with lambda, lambda equal to one, you can find that your quaternion at the end will be a function of a vector part X and a scalar part S that are all function of S, zeta, and sigma. Uh, so that will be really straightforward to demonstrate. So if you solve the characteristic equation by starting with a Newton method, method a Newton Raphson method with lambda equal to one, you are able to find a very uh, straightforward expression of the quaternion. And um, so, but as I told you, I will try to have uh, um, 
the final part of the lesson uh, uh, next uh, Thursday, so not tomorrow, but the next week, uh, in order to show you how to apply this method when you have a specific uh, observation. Uh, the other important, um, the other important uh, uh, task that the quest algorithm can accomplish is related to the uh, knowledge of the covariance of the attitude. So, in order to explain that, uh, you have to assume, uh, you have to consider that uh, when you want to determine uh, the error of the attitude, the error of the attitude is not that uh, does not depend on the reference frame. So it means that although we have the W and V in our previous uh, in our previous uh, uh, slides are in OBF and in ICRF. We were, we, in order to determine which is uh, the uh, errors, uh, um, so the covariance matrix of the attitude, we can assume that both vectors are defined in the body frame. So in, for example, in the OBF. So in that case, the attitude matrix is equal to one, okay? Uh, I don't want to confuse uh, with these, uh, uh, confuse you uh, to these, uh, um, with these, uh, uh, with this explanation. Uh, what we want to do here is only to assess which is uh, the attitude error, so the error that you have in the quaternions uh, given, for example, by a delta W and uh, and delta v. So these two quantities uh, do not depend on the reference frame. So in principle uh, you can assess uh, your errors by only um, uh, by by only considering the uh, by, by considering the two vectors uh, in for example uh, the optical bench frame or in the body frame. So the first condition that we have to consider is that the attitude error is independent from the orientation of the spacecraft. So uh, we are not going to do this demonstration. So that's the reason why for you could be out of the blue now the following uh, representation. But if you want detail on that, uh, you can uh, see on uh, the reference book. Uh, but we don't have time to explain, uh, to provide all the demonstration. Uh, but it can be easily demonstrated that if you uh, report the uh, vectors W and the vector V both in the uh, reference frame of the body frame, uh, for example, uh, you can write that uh, W it will be equal to uh, a W true plus delta omega, de de delta w, sorry. And you have also that v is equal, uh, now probably I will, I will provide confusion, it will be to w plus delta v. What I mean here, I mean that both vectors, so in case, So this is in case uh, both vectors uh, are OBF, okay? So if you have indeed uh, both vectors in the OBF frame uh, without errors, these two vectors uh, should be equal, correct? So if we want to assess the errors, uh, we don't need uh, to consider the ICRF, uh, but we can indeed report the errors uh, only in the body reference frame. So this W, uh, delta, w, delta W and Delta V are both reported in the OBF, but are independent errors because are an error given by the sensors, for example, 
And this is the error given by the, uh, let's say that we have um, a star trigger. It is the error given by the knowledge, uh, the wrong knowledge of the star uh, orientation. So the other assumption that we have to do in order to arrive to this uh, expression here is that these two uh, delta W, delta V are orthogonal to V and W. And of course, V and W are considered to be versors, so unit vectors. The other, the other constraint, so the other assumption that we are making is that the um, error vectors are symmetrically distributed in the plane orthogonal to V and W. So let's assume that you have V and W. You can construct a plane and the errors are symmetrically distributed with respect to the normal to this plane. So those uh, three assumptions enables uh, the construction of uh, these uh, covariance matrix here. So uh, that would mean in, in both, uh, in case both vectors are in, in OBF, okay, vectors are OBF, okay. So as I told you, we are not demonstrating that. Uh, if you are, um, if you want detail about that, you can look at the reference book. Huh? OBF. So you have uh, that if these three assumptions are correct, so you're reporting the two vectors in the OBF, you have that the, the, the vectors have an error in the orthogonal to the vector itself. You have that this one, so the inverse of this matrix, that is the identity matrix minus the sum of the um product of w wi transpose so it will be a three by one um one by three vector if you do the inverse of this matrix and multiply by the sigma total squared you are able to determine the covariance matrix of the quaternion so as I told you, we didn't do the demonstration, but the quest algorithm enables to express the covariance matrix by assuming these three uh, assumptions in this form. So this is important, for example, when you want to know instantaneously, so when you are, when you are inverting the attitude problem, so assume that you are using the quest algorithm. So you're using lambda equal to one and you determine the quaternion that maximizes uh, so the uh, eigenvalue. So you have uh, you have retrieved the quaternion at that epoch at that instant. These uh, covariance matrix uh, give you also the uncertainty of that uh, uh, determination. So uh, what you you can find here is that indeed uh, these uh, quantity are known. Also, the weight that that you are using to determine the quaternion is known because it is assumed by your um, by your formulation of the Baba problem. So this one give you the um, expression of the. Uh, covariance matrix. But note uh, that this matrix is only valid uh, if you have a small error quaternions because for all the consideration that we have done uh, above, so you're considering uh, delta B and delta W orthogonal to V and W and you have also symmetrically distributed the errors in the plane uh, normal to V and W in the plane normal to OK. Professore? Sì. Ma sigma totale, cos'è? Eh, so, the, what is sigma tot? We are going to, the, to introduce that now. So, sigma tot is also 
in the demonstration. So we are not going to demonstrate that. Uh, but sigma tot, so the inverse of the squares of the sigma of sigma tot is given by the sum of the uh, sigmas of each measurement. Okay, so let's, for example, assume um, that, for example, uh, that sigma i, uh, so it is the sum for each observation, where sigma i is the sum of the, not only the errors given by the sensors, but this also takes into account the errors given by the catalog. So for each measurement, you will have a sigma i, and that also uh, answered the question that was done before, and uh, it is related to the uh, coefficients that you have to use to develop a problem. Sigma i needs to be, um, needs to account for the uh, uh, star tracker measurement errors and the catalog errors if you have a star uh, tracker. So, so not only the fact that you have an errors in your measurements given by the sensor itself, but also the errors that is given by your wrong knowledge of uh, the celestial object. So for example, if you have an error in delta V. So sigma i, for each observation takes into account the star trigger measurement errors and the catalog errors. So the error given by the uh, sensor, delta W, and the error given by the uh, knowledge, the wrong knowledge of your observed body in the case of a star trigger is given by the catalog error. So as it was asked uh, this morning, of course, uh, when we are going to do an exercise on that, that will be really helpful uh, because you will see how to indeed uh, use those equations directly to uh, determine the attitude of the spacecraft. Another difficulty that you have right now is that we have not introduced yet the sensors. So each sensor will have its different sigma i and uh, consequently, we are going to use a different AI. So the sigma i, as I told you, is a combination of delta omega and, uh, sorry, delta w and delta b. So the error in the sensors and error in the knowledge of the celestial body. So once we know that uh, for star trackers it's really simple because it is a, an error given by the measurement errors as we are going to see briefly today, but also there is an error in the catalog. So you have delta W and delta B. So when you do the covariance matrix, this sigma tot has to take into account all of that. The other information is given by AI and uh, WI is indeed the measurement, uh, your, your, your measurement of uh, uh, your direct measurement. Um, so here is also report the case in which we have a small quaternions in the uh, orbital reference frame. So assuming, for example, that delta Q1 corresponds to um, the um, roll axis variation, delta Q2 is the pitch axis variation, delta Q3 is the uh, yo axis variation. Um, you can find uh, that these uh, quaternions uh, can be expressed uh, um, in terms uh, of uh, these uh, theta. So if you basically, if you substitute uh, uh, to the Q, uh, these uh, expression of uh, theta X, theta Y, and theta Zeta, you can find that uh, the um, uh, covariance uh, matrix of V theta is four times this one. Also, this one is not demonstrated, so it's not really important. Uh, it's only an example that uh, when you have uh, uh, small quaternions and you are trying to solve your reference frame with respect to the uh, orbital reference frame, you can approximate your quaternion to these angles. So, so 
for uh, as a, my my suggestions usually what uh, it is used directly is the quaternion expression is not is the best way to determine the attitude um, because uh, it is, it depends for example only on the um, transformation from the optical bench frame to the inertial reference frame so this further representation uh, can can indeed uh, is uh, can be helpful if you are trying to uh, have a spacecraft an ID pointed because in that case the optical bench frame is requested to be close to the uh, roll pitch and your axis so that's what is meant is meant here but as I told you, the important thing here is that this is the expression of the covariance matrix. Sigma total is equal to the sum of the inverse um, of the uh, squares of uh, the uh, sigma i. So the, uh, the errors that are given by the sensor itself, so in, in case of star trigger, star trigger measurement errors, and the catalog error in case always of Strataker that is given by delta V. So this one basically accounts for both delta W and delta V. As to take into account, in case of star trackers, this one is the star tracker measurement errors and this one is the catalog error. And other uh, important things to do indeed, in order to have a simplified approach is to use that uh, uh, your um, coefficients, uh, uh, scale coefficients for the VABA problem are equal to the um, squares of sigma total divided by sigma i. This is a good approach that is used. Um, I will conclude this part, uh, um, as I told you, will be done an exercise that would be, uh, of course, uh, provide you the uh, how to apply this formulation in a realistic case. Uh, I think that we are going to do an example with Baby Colombo. The um, other algorithm, I mean, there are other algorithms to solve the VABA problem. One of them is the SVD algorithm. I'm only give you, uh, tell you telling you um, that there is another algorithm. I'm not going to provide a demonstration of how to solve the BABA problem with the SPD algorithm. But the single value, value the, uh, the composition is uh, an important uh, uh, approach because uh, uh, exploits basically, it is based on the properties of uh, uh, square matrices that basically you are able to uh, split these matrix uh, B, so the alto profile matrix in uh, um, two orthogonal matrices U and B and the diagonal matrix S. It can be demonstrated that the attitude matrix uh, will depend indeed from U, V, and uh, this diagonal matrix 1, 1, D. So where D is uh, the product of the determinant of U and uh, V. I'm not going to give you any details on that. Um, if you are interested on solving the VABA problem with uh, uh, an additional uh, representation, SPD is uh, one of the suggested. However, quest algorithm works fine and is used uh, in, um, for uh, attitude determination. Um, the other thing that I would like to highlight with this slide is that, uh, uh, as we have discussed so far, those uh, methods, so the quest algorithm and the triad algorithm, provides a single frame attitude determination. Okay, so we are estimating the um, attitude of a spacecraft at the same time at ti. So we need to determine, so we need to have observation close to a desired time ti every time. Now we have, uh, uh, we will have uh, a couple or uh, actually four or five uh, lessons uh, on the sensors. So why now there is a break uh, from the two methods? 
because now we have introduced uh, two methods that provide the static determination of the spacecraft attitude. So if we know, if we have at least two observations, we are able to solve for the attitude matrix of the spacecraft with the triad algorithm or more precisely with the quest algorithm. So the attitude determination hardware, uh, as we know, is mainly given by uh, four uh, sensors. So we will uh, going to um, discuss uh, uh, the star trackers that I'm going to introduce today, but we are going to see in detail tomorrow. And we also we are going to see also tomorrow the gyroscopes. These two are uh, really tied together uh, because um, they uh, basically need each other. Uh, for different reasons, because uh, stair triggers are much more accurate uh, with respect to gyroscopes. But we are going also, and those represent indeed uh, the two main sensors for uh, um, extra, uh, so interplanetary spacecraft. Since we, uh, we don't have, uh, for example, the Earth, uh, but uh, for uh, Earth satellites uh, are widely spread, uh, used. Uh, uh, the Earth sensors, and we are going to see a couple of uh, uh, Earth sensors. And sensors that can be used for both interplanetary and uh, Earth satellites are the Sun sensors. So those are the four categories. The reason why there is a break between the attitude of the algorithm determination is because now we can use, uh, for example, uh, these, uh, these and these other uh, sensor in order to determine the attitude. So, as we said, we need the vector W that is given by the sensor, WI. We need to know where the object is. So, for the stars, uh, we need to know the star catalog, so where it is the stars uh, with respect to us. For the Earth sensor, we need to know where is the Earth, and for the Sun sensor, the Sun. So usually are given by the ephemeris of those bodies, or and also the orientation parameters, because when we are going to look at the Earth sensors, uh, the Earth, when you are orbiting the Earth, you are not all able to see the, the Earth as the stars. Stars are so far that you are able to approximate as a, basically uh, a point, a pixel in your star sensor. For the Earth, you have the discrete shape of the Earth. So you need to take into account the, uh, and that actually provides uh, uh, an advantage for the Earth sensors. So you're able to see, for example, a specific region of the Earth. But all of that we are going to see in detail. The reason why there is a break here, is because for the um, extended Kalman filter that is not a single frame at determination software, we need to introduce the gyroscopes. So the gyroscopes enables continuous integration of the attitude kinematic equation because basically we, we can have a snapshot of the attitude um, rotation matrix, or actually the attitude the, uh, spin, so the angular velocity of the spacecraft, that is uh, important for, uh, for the continuity of your data set. Another important thing is that, uh, as we have seen so far, the attitude determination software that we have discussed are able only to determine the attitude matrix. So if you have sensors, you can use these vectors here to determine or the attitude matrix directly with the triad problem. So this is the triad. Or the quaternion, so it is a Q, if you have the quest algorithm. So you are always, always solving 
we are only always uh, solving only the orientation of the spacecraft so the attitude or the quaternion the Kalman filter enables uh, the estimation of other parameters uh, for example uh, mismodeling that are introduced by the sensors in case of gyroscopes this is fundamental because fun uh, the gyroscopes uh, that provides you the measurement of the uh, angular velocity of the spacecraft are affected by biases, drift, and other beast modeling that we are going to treat in the following lessons. So, so far you are able to, if you have uh, measurements from stress triggers, earth sensors, and sun sensors, you are able to determine the attitude matrix and the quest The problem is that if you have gyroscopes, you, those methods are not well suited to determine the attitude because the gyroscopes provides you mismodeling and you need to estimate not only the attitude metrics but also additional parameters as we are going to see. So since we have five minutes late, uh, five minutes uh, actually um, uh, up to the um, to the end of the of the lesson. Uh, we need uh, uh, we are only able to introduce uh, the star sensors, and um, that will be the first hardware that we are going to discuss in the first in the next four uh, lectures. So the star sensors uh, represents the um, of course the main. Um, hardware that is used for interplanetary spacecraft. First of all, because as I said, the stars are always visible and you're able to determine the attitude, so it will be a very reliable um, hardware. The other important thing is that uh, stars enables the realization of inertial reference frame. So you since our objects very far from us, represents um, objects that can be indeed uh, related to um, determine uh, inertia reference frame. So for example, as you, as you have seen in the previous part of the course, quasar are used to determine the um, ICRF, so the inertial terrestrial reference frame. So those objects represent indeed our milestones, our uh, piece of information to determine the inertial reference frame. Um, the other important thing is that uh, since uh, those stars are observed and are well cataloged, you're able to have a radar session and declination of those objects with very high accuracies. So, as it is written here, outstanding precisions at the level of milli arc seconds. As we have seen said before, one arc second is one over uh, 3,600 uh, 3, degrees. So it is a very small amount. Here you are considered 10 to the minus three arc seconds. So, what I mean is that uh, so you have that one arc second is a very small amount of a degree. The star trackers give you 10 to the minus 3 of this quantity and also up to one uh, 10 to the minus six, one micron arc second. So, and uh, the other all main property is that the stars are always available and um, you are able to determine uh, optical imaging in space. And the technology is that, you are, that you are using to determine the um, position of it, so the relative orientation of a star is very reliable and it is based on a CCD. Uh, so you're able to determine uh, the projection of stars on this CCD and by locating the pixel of the stars, you are able to have a matching between the no knowledge, uh, so the known uh, um, orientation of the spacecraft, uh, of the stars 
in the in the color in the catalog and uh, uh, we are is, you are able to uh, match this uh, position uh, so this relative orientation with what you're seeing from your ccd as we are going to see tomorrow However, there are uh, some uh, disadvantages of star sensors. Uh, one of the questions that I could ask you during the exam is that if you have uh, to determine the attitude of a spacecraft around the Earth, uh, what kind of sensor you would use? Uh, probably 99% uh, of people would answer, yes, I would, I would use a star sensor. Uh, but the star sensor, because it's very accurate and you can have uh, for the reason that I said before, those kind of positions. Well, the problem is that the uh, star sensor represents a very high cost hardware. So uh, you have to justify your cost in order so the level of precision that you need has to be consistent with the, the cost of the mission. As you remember in the, the previous, in the initial uh, example that I did with the laser altimeter, in that case, uh, we found out uh, that we, we needed uh, a precision of uh, one arc second. So probably in that case, uh, star trackers uh, was necessary because, um, for example, you are not able to have uh, this level of precision for the entire orbit with only star sensor, uh, with only Earth sensor and Sun sensors. But in case you have a small spacecraft uh, and you don't need to have precision of one arc second, so let's assume that you have a communication satellite that doesn't need uh, with low gain antennas, so you don't need a very high precision uh, spacecraft uh, attitude, you can use uh, a cheaper uh, hardware. And so star triggers are not really the best, uh, does not represent the best uh, hardware. Uh, the other main problem is the computation uh, that you need from your hardware because you are need to pro you need to process uh, the star sensors uh, um, so the star measurements uh, with a very high sample rate uh, and you have a lot of information you have to load your catalogs so, so are computationally very demanding and um, also, you need to develop a star sensor that is really um, dependent from the mission that you are considering. And this is represent what we are going to see tomorrow, because indeed you're going to see that you are not able to use one star sensor for each spacecraft. But since you are going to see, for example, different portion of the sky, you need to uh, design the star sensors in order to provide the best measurements in the specific case. So the main, one of the main disadvantages is that each star sensor has to be tailored to the mission that you are considering. And that will be clearer tomorrow where we're going to discuss the properties of star sensors. So I will, I will conclude here. Uh, so it is known, so I will answer just one uh, question briefly if you have it otherwise we are going to uh, have a lesson tomorrow at noon i will uh, try to connect a few minutes earlier so we can uh, we can have uh, we can discuss about your comments tomorrow